Thank you for joining us. Many people consider this to be an unusually important time in history with many domestic and international issues of considerable concern. We cannot ignore these realities or avoid talking about the political scene in the United States as it also relates to Israel. Our guests today are Congressman Alcee Hastings, who will focus upon education and employment, and later in the program, Ambassador John Bolton, who will share his views on the relationship of the United States of America with Israel. The signs are everywhere. Hire heroes, vet supply. Companies appear to be bullish when it comes to hiring veterans. That's what we found at this recent job fair in Fresno. And our goal is to um, offer um, veterans uh, positions with our company. But a closer look at the unemployment numbers for vets show why it might be harder than you think for some in the military to go from this to this. In the military, you have that sense of purpose. You know, you wake up every day and you put on a uniform and you're proud to wear it. You know, you come home and you, know, you wait in a line for an interview. 26-year-old Scott Ford signed up for the Marines as soon as he graduated high school in 2004. He was headed to Iraq, but Ford suffered an injury and served the rest of his time back in the States. When he got out in 2007, he tried to find work. Uh, I, I applied uh, everywhere and never really got my foot in the door. Recent numbers from the Bureau of Labor Statistics show that younger veterans who fought in Iraq and Afghanistan have a higher unemployment rate than other vets. In 2011, it was at 30 percent. I think one of the biggest challenges people don't understand. Linda Holt, a human resources specialist with the Veterans Administration in Fresno, says many employers don't have a real understanding of the skills veterans have. If you've never served in the military, the military has a lot of acronyms that people don't understand. So to get that into your resume and to get it into the employer's hands, they need to understand exactly what skills do you have that you can offer them. Another huge concern, the public's misconception that all vets coming home from war have mental problems. Some people may come back with issues, but those issues can be fixed. It does not mean you can't get past it. It does not mean you're not employable. And it does not mean that you couldn't do a good job. The frustration of not being able to find work is sending many veterans back to school, especially now that so many jobs require a college education. I had this conception that, uh, that my experience would outweigh my lack of education. And, uh, and I, I, I still believe that a little bit but you have to have the education to get to the interview to prove your experience. Veterans who enroll in college also qualify for the VA's work-study program. They not only earn an income, but gain valuable experience working at the Veterans Administration. For instance, Scott, who is a marketing major, works in the public affairs office. He says the job gives him a sense of purpose. And that's vital, vital. And, uh, and so coming here and working, you get that responsibility, you get that camaraderie uh, that, that you miss in the Marines. With us now is Congresswoman Alcee Hastings. A real pleasure and honor to have you back on the show. Thank you very it's much. It's been a while. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> yeah. Well, here we are in the year 2012, soon 2013, and all we can do is hope for a brighter future for all of us. How do you see the issues and the concerns facing the United States at this time in general without getting it too dated? Well, uh, in general, uh, the economy uh, is uh, the primary issue uh, that we are confronted with in this country as well as around the world. Uh, the globalization uh, that has taken place in the, th in the last 30 years has changed America uh, substantially. And I think that uh, Mr. Romney and President uh, Obama are going to have to make it very clear what their vision is uh, to try and change uh, uh, the uh, circumstances. They keep referring, not them, 
Uh, but people keep referring to the circumstances that uh, the United States is in as the new normal. I refer to it as the new normal abnormal because when people are not working, uh, then there can't be consumption. And when there is no consumption, you can't have productivity. And so I think that those are, are the critical issues. Healthcare, of course, is always uh, a front burner uh, issue. And you can't have any of this uh, uh, without talking about education. One of my very best friends in the world is someone you know, Dr. Abram Fischler. He's the President Emeritus of Nova Southeastern University right. and very much involved with the transformation of education. What are your thoughts on improving education following, for example, Dr. Fischler's vision? First off, um, Abe and I uh, go back uh, from the beginning of Nova. Uh, and I was uh, one of uh, the interim professors that was satellited out in the criminal justice program and he uh, uh, recruited me when I was a circuit court judge. Abe went on uh, to be on the school board. But to answer your question uh, directly, uh, every child comes on this earth unless he or she is disabled with the ability uh, not to perform uh, as much as any other child. Uh, the disparities uh, that are a residual of uh, the segregated circumstances that our nation was in and this county. I filed the original school desegregation case here in Fort Lauderdale, Broward County that led to the integration of the schools. That still has not stopped the economic uh, disparities. What has to happen is we have to make sure every child has a computer, every family has one. We have to make sure that they get magazines and newspapers and are uh, conversant with social media. And that's not happening. So if I was to introduce anything into the school system, it would be technology. If I was to follow up, I would make sure that we are training people for the new normal whatever it is defined as, and uh, for the jobs that are available. That's been Germany's and Israel's success. Their apprentice programs uh, train people to do what is available to be done, and doesn't just empty people out with history degrees and psychology, no offense meant to either, uh, but uh, the fact of the matter is uh, we have to structurally uh, put an investment in teachers and uh, stop uh, the kinds of activities that are making people, uh, teachers be bad people. Sir, I'd like to ask you before we conclude, what are your views on the cooperation between the State of Israel and the United States? There's no daylight between the United States and Israel. The circumstances that we are confronted with uh, in the Middle East are uh, the kinds of things that require our rapt attention. Um, uh, the days for diplomacy um, uh, with Iran, with the uh, development of nuclear weaponry, uh, uh, growing short. I think Prime Minister Netanyahu made it very clear uh, that there is a percentage uh, that they may reach uh, that will require uh, action uh, to stop them from achieving a nuclear weapon. I believe that Israel and the United States are firmly committed um, uh, to that, and it's my great hope uh, that it will be clearly understood by everyone in spite of uh, the outward appearances um, uh, with reference to uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu and President Obama. The simple fact of the matter is Netanyahu is not Israel and Obama is not America. They just happen to be leaders. But those of us in Congress, whether we are Republican or Democrat, are, are tremendous friends of uh, the uh, state of Israel and there will be uh, no retreating uh, from assisting them in doing whatever is necessary uh, to assure that Iran does not get a nuclear weapon. Another question I have for you, sir, is with regard to education and the concern for returning army vets yes. and so forth, and the, the uh, re-employment of the engineers in, in space, the space, aerospace industry and so forth, who have lost their jobs due to the ending of the shuttle program. What are we doing with regard uh, to training and recertification and finding employment for returning vets? Uh, we uh, uh, have uh, programs that have been introduced uh, that will be hire a hero. Uh, my programs. I was so, sorely disappointed um, uh, that the United States Senate did not take up a measure offered by one of my Republican colleagues that would have done just that, uh, prepare 
uh, for these uh, uh, people that are coming home. For example, 33,000 people are coming from Afghanistan into an economy that doesn't have any jobs. They are persons that have given of their time, their life, and indeed their fortune uh, in order to be able to make this country go forward. We need to go back to the old days. When veterans didn't have an education, we developed a veterans education program. When veterans didn't have a home, we developed a veterans homes uh, uh, program. In this particular era, we have these young people coming back with all of this technological experience and this economy moving from a manufacturing to a technological and service economy. And we need to be able to utilize their services and give them the same kind of priorities. Veterans came home from Korea and Vietnam and what they were given was extra points when they went to the post office. So they got the jobs and we need to give them that kind of consideration. I see that as just as primary as as us sending them to Iraq and Afghanistan. And we need to have countless numbers of uh, vendors made available uh, at the same time uh, as Debbie Wasserman shows, Ted Schultz, and uh, Ted uh, uh, Deutsch, and uh, Frederica Wilson, and I have done. There needs to be a good deal more of uh, that kind of activity in order for veterans to be hired. Congressman, this has been most interesting. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. It's Thank been you, an sir. honor. Thanks. Again, shalom. Thank you, sir. <laughs>
Back in 88, their president Rafsanjani himself said that the country should be armed in the offensive use of chemical, bacterial, and radiological weapons. Its pursuit of nuclear weapons and its needless provocation place it on a dangerous path. They've also said that it would be rational to consider using nukes to destroy at least one country, Israel. And they'd love to see the same thing happen to America too. این راه روشنی است که شهیدان ما باز کردند و این راه ادامه پیدا خواهد کرد. There are many ways they could get a nuclear bomb into America. They could hide it in a cargo ship. They could launch an attack from ships far offshore. They could smuggle it in from Mexico. When you talk to the Mexican government as I have, they they will admit that there are many Iranian operatives in Mexico and they don't know exactly where they are. They don't have a real accounting. Imagine the devastation one of these bombs could cause in any U.S. city. Another scenario is a nuclear bomb detonated at high altitude. It's something congressional commissions and others have investigated and said that it's a credible threat. It's not like a normal weapon. It sets off a reaction that's far more dangerous than the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. It would cause severe damage or catastrophic destruction to the electric grid across America. It wouldn't be like a normal blackout. Everything ultimately depends upon electric power. Communications, transportation, banking and finance, and food and water. That means that when the stores are emptied, there's almost no way to get food. It means most water faucets are dead. No way to pump gas not much in the way of medical care. Hospitals also rely on electricity. Almost no way to get money, no internet or email. You can't call your family or anyone else for help. And without electricity, nuclear power plants melt down. If their containment buildings are breached, the areas around them could become uninhabitable for centuries. Anarchy, starvation, disease. Within 12 months of an EMP event, given the current state of unpreparedness, you know, we would lose most of our population. Estimates range anywhere from two-thirds to 90 percent of the American people would perish from a single nuclear weapon. One. I think the threat is here. Uh, the vulnerability is here and the threat is here. This is a different world. If we stop this regime, we can free the Iranian people, ourselves, and the rest of the world from the threat. Mr. Ambassador, it's a real honor and privilege to have you on the Shalom Show. Oh, glad to be with you. So, so many of our viewers admire you as one of the real true statesmen in this day and age. So we are really honored. No, I appreciate the invitation to be with you. I'd like to ask you how you see the level of how critical the current state of affairs is. Well, I think there are obviously not just domestic economic issues at play, although those are at the top of the agenda, but issues that are critical for America's national security, for our uh, friends and allies around the world and, and for international peace and security. I think we've been pursuing a very dangerous uh, foreign policy the past uh, four years. I think it's left America weaker in the world. I think it's left our friends and allies more at risk. I think the uh, war against uh, international terror has not been prosecuted effectively and I think the threat of nuclear proliferation is growing. Many people echo that thought and I'd like to ask you some people are saying that this event in Benghazi, as an example, is actually worse than that of the hostage situation in Iran many years ago. What are your thoughts on that? Well, it's worse by definition. Four Americans are dead. That's a tragedy, and it's a, a failure by the administration. I think in large measure uh, it's explained by the uh, ideology of the administration. They couldn't understand or wouldn't understand uh, that the war on terrorism is not over, that al-Qaeda has not been defeated, that the fall of Gaddafi didn't bring sweetness and light to Libya. And that screen over consciousness, that ideology that prevented them from seeing facts that all others could see, uh, led to a desire uh, not to have increased security in Libya, led to the increased risk for all of our personnel, and if anything, invited the attack. 
So this is a, a uh, symbol, I think, of a failed policy, a policy that doesn't adequately protect uh, American interest. But in many ways, it could well be 1979 all over again. I don't think the threat to our embassies in the Middle East is gone by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, that's why the uh, importance of this election is so striking, because I think with a different policy, with a Reaganite policy of peace through strength, you would have a very different environment in the region, uh, and we'd be much closer to achieving long-standing American objectives. So many of our viewers are very concerned with the state of Israel and its position in the world. Would you say that currently Israel is in greater danger than before? Uh, it certainly is in greater danger. Not only are its borders less secure, but as Iran approaches uh, its long-sought goal of a deliverable nuclear weapon, uh, the very existence of the state of Israel is in jeopardy. Uh, this really is an existential threat. Ariel Sharon, uh, I think, was the first person to uh, to call this risk that of a nuclear holocaust. But he's exactly right. Israel is a small state, as we all know. Half a dozen nuclear weapons, there wouldn't be any state. And uh, it doesn't take much to uh, see what the Iranian leadership has in mind. They've held conferences in recent years with titles like The World Without Israel. So when you do strategic analysis, it's not that complicated. You look at capabilities and intentions. They've stated what their intentions are. They're close to having the capabilities. Uh, we either wake up in advance or we're going to suffer the consequences. Is Israel as important an ally to the United States as ever? Well, I think it's more important. It's the only stable democracy in the region. Uh, it alone faces the threat of, uh, of an Iranian nuclear attack in the short term. But it's also demonstrated that uh, it's a stable partner in the Middle East, and there are many Arab governments, many Arab governments, that, uh, that don't want Iran to have nuclear weapons any more than Israel does. So the possibility, if we can get past the imminent threat of Iran, both as a source of nuclear weapons and as the world's central banker for international terrorism, I think that the prospects for stability in the region are not completely gone, but they're being dissipated because we don't have effective American leadership. So in this day and age, honesty is more important than ever, and to be realistic and be in touch with reality. What are your thoughts on what some people allege is a cover-up with regard to the tragedy in Benghazi? Well, I understand why people looking at the way the administration has handled uh, the tragedy in Benghazi could think that, because the story that the administration uh, has come up with uh, doesn't hold water. The attack on the consulate in Benghazi, the attacks on our uh, embassies around the region uh, were not caused by some movie video trailer. Uh, the attack on, in Benghazi was a planned terrorist attack. Uh, others were directed by radicals. It was, after all, the 11th anniversary of September the 11th. That's not coincidental. Uh, and I think the administration's unwillingness to admit that has given some people to think that there's a cover-up going on. Myself, I think it's uh, much more likely that it's ideology, which puts a screen over the administration's ability to process facts from the real world. They can't admit that uh, al-Qaeda is not defeated. They can't admit that the war on terrorism continues because the terrorists continue to attack us. Uh, and honestly, I'd prefer that, uh, that for the sake of our country that it was a cover-up because that would at least indicate the administration comprehends reality, even if it's trying to obscure it. Many regard the outrage throughout the Arab world as feigned and just a pretext for hooliganism, as so many times before. Before we conclude, sir, what message would you have for Jews at this time? Well, I think the issue of America's relation with Israel has never been clear. I think the Obama presidency is a radical departure from the bipartisan American policy we followed with respect to Israel since the modern state was created in 1948. Uh, Obama has distanced himself from Israel publicly, uh, given encouragement to adversaries of our relationship, failed to deal adequately with the threat of terrorism, failed to deal adequately with the threat of the Iranian nuclear weapons program, a very, very dangerous security situation in the Middle East. So to me, the importance of getting a change of leadership in Washington uh, important as it is on the economic issues, is absolutely critical for America's national security and for the U.S.-Israel relationship.
Sir, this has been a great privilege and an honor. Thank you so much well, for being with us. Well, thank you very much. Glad thank to be you with you. Thank you, sir. I'll be right back. This concludes our special show for today. I'm Richard Peretz. Thank you for being with us.